For those of you who are new, my name is Brian. I'm the pastor here at Mission Gathering. And something that sets uh, Mission Gathering and really many progressive churches apart from more conservative or fundamentalist churches is our sermons are meant to start discussions, not end them. The goal is not for you to agree with everything that I say or for us to all agree and think the same about everything. The goal is to think critically about what we believe and become more loving, Christ-like people in the process. So with that being said, um, I follow these YouTubers. Um, yes, <laughs> you're, like, you're like, that's a transition. I, I follow these YouTubers. They're, they call themselves the Vlog Brothers. Uh, John and Hank Green, and yes, that is the same John Green who wrote Fault in Our Stars, for those of you who are familiar. And these guys, they have, for many, many years, they're kind of the original folks who got started on YouTube in the very early days of it. And essentially, they just create these vlogs back and forth. And so it's just this life update as brothers every single week where one of them will film, film a video one day of the week, another will film another day of the week. And the younger brother of the two, Hank Green, he has this quote that has become pretty well known that I really, really resonate with. And it is, uh-oh, I don't think my clicker is working. Well, can, I, can I trust you to follow along with me there? Yes. All right. So he has this quote that says, I had a very happy childhood, but I, was, I just wasn't a very happy child. <laughs> and I resonate with that a lot because as many of you guys know, I grew up in Temecula. And Temecula, all through my childhood and even up until quite recently, was one of the top 10 safest cities in the United States. So it was this very quaint town. I had a very happy child, childhood, but from a very early age, I struggled with depression and anxiety, just biologically, chemically, and, all, and through high school and on, I started antidepressants and have always been on that ever since. And as I've said before, I am a recover recovering emo kid. Yes, that is me in high school right there. And so my parents had a very interesting journey with me and my brothers. I was always very moody all through my childhood and teenage years. And so it was definitely an interesting journey for my parents, not just with me, but I was the youngest of three boys. And so while I was a handful with, you know, my emo-ness and all of that fun stuff, my parents also had my two older brothers to navigate. And my oldest, they, they, are also a, they also were a handful in and of themselves. My oldest brother, Micah, from a very early age, as a baby and toddler, he would try to and sometimes succeed in diving out of his crib so absolutely terrifying experience for them, absolutely overwhelming, and he still does overwhelming and obnoxious things to this day to terrify my parents to their very soul. And yes, that is the Grand Canyon that he is hanging right on over there. And then in addition to that, there is my middle brother. And my middle brother, Jordan, he kind of had this statement that he became infamous for throughout his childhood, which is, I have to find out for myself. And he would often say this as he did life-threatening things. <laughs> so that put him very much at risk. He is now a doctor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so you have this whole handful of us. We were quite a handful growing up. And we grew up all together in the Christian tradition at a church in Temecula together. And while I have continued kind of on this journey, while I was in high school, my oldest brother told our family that he was no longer a Christian. And then several years later, my middle brother did the same, telling us that he no longer really identified with the Christian tradition. He really wanted to, wants to believe in a loving God, but just simply looking at different things, he just can't seem to get there. Which, coming from my background, as I'm sure many of you guys can identify with, in my religious upbringing, not being a Christian meant something pretty big. Namely, 
worrying about their afterlife in terms of eternal, potentially eternal hellfire. To quote Nacho Libre, you know, I'm a little concerned about your salvation and stuff. That was kind of my reality growing up. I worried about my brother's eternal salvation. And frankly, so did my parents. And if you grew up Christian, you likely worried about someone's salvation as well in your life. In fact, if you come here, you've perhaps experienced people being worried about your salvation. <laughs> because as you move toward more progressive Christianity, or for those of you who you've come out to friends or family members, there is sometimes those concerns about salvation. And I share this with all of you because there's this very interesting statistic about um, Mother's Day. Mother's Day is statistically, it is one of the top three most attended days to, at church. And that is the quantitative data in terms of the numbers, but if you look at the qualitative data in terms of why that is, it's the fact of the matter that every parent wants the best for their child. And, and so if you have this narrative of hellfire, of worrying about your friends or family members' salvation, naturally, no parent wants their kid to go to hell. And so if, if, if a parent is asked, what do you want to, like, we'll, we'll do anything, like, what would you like to do if they're worried, you know, about their kid's salvation, they're gonna say, let's go to church. And so this is one of the primary reasons why Mother's Day is so well attended in so many churches, because of this underlying anxiety about hell. And so I just want to kind of say today, your loved ones aren't going to hell. Amen. Because nobody's going to hell. So that, that which, the first part might be comfortable for some, but then wait, what, for some of us, and depending on your tradition which you grew up in, that last part might be a little uncomfortable to hear. But the reality is nobody is going to hell. If you look at kind of the depth of the Christian tradition, there has always been this diversity of views about the afterlife. And th through the thread of the entirety of Christian history, there has always been the existence of what is called Christian universalism, that every single person will be saved. Every single person will go to heaven. And as I said, you don't have to agree with everything that I say, but I definitely identify with Christian universalism, that nobody is going to hell. Your loved ones are not going to hell because nobody is. Amen. If you look at the stories of Jesus, particularly the, the, core, the core story of Jesus dying on the cross, there is this story where he's looking upon the people who are crucifying him, the Roman soldiers who are literally committing murder. They are killing him in the worst possible way imaginable. Crucifixion was the most painful way to die at the time. It was literally death by torture. And what Jesus says when he looks upon these people is not condemnation. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Which, that's something you say about like a child, you know, just kind of goofing off. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. You don't say that about someone committing murder. Yet that's what Jesus says. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And then the story goes on to say, and they cast lots to divide his clothing. They were literally gambling for his clothes. To, as if to cut the author to kind of say, yeah, they knew what they were doing. But this is Christ's heart. In the midst of all of this, Christ's heart for the people doing the worst thing imaginable, it was pure forgiveness and understanding. And so I just want to say that I think Christ's heart is pure forgiveness and understanding toward you and your loved ones as well. That that is the core of just a big part, a radical part of the gospel, that every single person is unconditionally loved by God. There is this heart of pure forgiveness and unconditional love and understanding for all of us. And one of the stories of Easter, there's this narrative where Peter, one of Jesus' core disciples, 
he's struggling with this radical guilt because he has rejected Christ, so to speak. That there were three different times leading up to Jesus being crucified where he denied knowing Jesus. And so there's this story where Peter, after the resurrection, he's gone back to his old life, he's fishing, and he sees Jesus, and Jesus asks him, do you love me? And there's this, and there's this radical guilt that Peter feels, and he keeps responding, yes, I love you. And Jesus asks him three different times, do you love me? And it's this idea of scholars kind of generally agree that Jesus is seeking to help Peter relieve the guilt that he feels because Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. And so Jesus offers him this chance to, to say, I love, I, yes, I love you three different times. And after all of this, the text says, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. And so nothing changes. This is the very thing Jesus said to Peter before he did anything, before he did anything wrong in his mind, Jesus offers him the chance to follow him. And then once again, now after all of this, Jesus once again says to him, follow me. Because lo God's love, it does not change based on our choices. We sometimes get this idea in our Christian narrative that you can somehow maybe lose your salvation or if you change your beliefs, now somehow you're being rejected by God. But if you look at the overarching narratives of scripture, God's love does not change based on our choices. We are all unconditionally loved by God. The idea of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, all of that is so that all of humanity, not just a select few who believe, but all of humanity, will be accepted and loved by God. And so I think this is so important to recognize because there's all these stories, there's all this rhetoric of hellfire that is out there in the world of Christian churches. And some of us who are more prone toward anxiety, our minds can latch onto that, and that can become something that you're not just worried about the salvation of others, but some of us who are mo more prone toward anxiety, even if you do believe in Jesus, even if you are a devout Christian, many Christians still struggle with this underlying anxiety. Well, like, well what if? What if I'm not devout enough? What if I don't actually believe the right things? And so there can be this deep underlying concern where for Peter, he was one of the core disciples, yet he still carried this radical guilt. And I think many of us can relate to that on some level. Like I said, if you grew up Christian and if you struggle with anxiety, you probably carry that to some extent to where you don't just worry about the salvation of others, but about our own salvation as well. And so if you're, that, if you're that type of person, I just want to say that God's love for you is, is also unconditional. You're not going to hell. And once again, that's, that's because no one is going to hell. And so I want to just present to us this idea today to just cast aside any anxiety about hell. Nobody, absolutely nobody is going to hell. God's love is radically unconditional. And this, this theme and this belief of Christian universalism has existed all through Christian history. In fact, very early on, it was actually more of the dominant view within Christian history. A lot of the words that get translated as hell are arguably mistranslations. We have missed the plot of God's love for humanity of what the point of all of this is about. It's not about just escaping, escaping some punishment after death and going to heaven after we die, but it's about making earth look a little more like heaven. In fact, really the, when Jesus gets together his disciples on his final night with them, this is kind of the, the underlying theme of it when he pours out the wine and he talks about it as blood, wine also represented this idea of heaven. 
and bread represented humanity. And so it's this, this idea of heaven and earth coming together, of humanity living into the fullness of Christ. There is no mention of this idea of hell within Jesus talking about the gospel with his disciples. This isn't something that he consistently preaches about, believe in me and you'll go to heaven after you die, believe in me and you won't go to hell. This is something that we have radically inserted in, but it's time we dismantle it. And so as we participate in communion together, we talk about how as disciples of Christ, the denomination that we're part of, disciples, practices open communion, open table communion. And what that means is that every single person is welcome at the table of grace. Every single person is welcome to participate in communion. And the purpose of that is because we recognize that God doesn't reject anyone. The idea that God rejects certain people based on beliefs or behaviors is simply false. If anything, one of Jesus' primary criticisms was that he dined at the table with people who religion rejected. And so that's the tension, and that's, we're still trying to catch up to that. We have this tendency to then say, well, what about those people? What about these people? And we're always trying to exclude, we're always trying to move back away from the radical grace and love of Christ. And so as you come to the table today of participating in communion, know that this is a symbol of the fact that every single one of us is accepted fully, loved unconditionally, that no one is rejected. Not you, nor your friends, nor your loved ones. And so cast aside any anxiety of hell, whether for you or for a friend or family member who is not a Christian. All of us, absolutely every single person is loved unconditionally. Let me pray. God, I thank you so much for your radical, unconditional love, God, and I pray that you would help us to embrace that. I pray that you would help us to understand that. I pray that you would help us to live into and catch up to that, that none of us would view ourselves or other people as less than, that none of us would view ourselves or other people as someone who is condemned by God but that each and every one of us would understand this radical love and inclusion and that, that we would embrace that and that we would live that out, both in embracing self-love, but also love of our neighbor, love of enemy, love of all. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.